Now, uh, Dr. Hussein Mir. Uh, I think that everybody knows Dr. Hussein, uh, consultant radiologist and in nuclear medicine. So he's going to talk about nuclear endocrinology. Please, Dr. Hussein. Assalamu alaikum. Ah, okay. So I press here. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure everybody uh, familiar with uh, what we are talking about, uh, nuclear medicine. In the beginning, I want to compare between nuclear medicine and radiology. So in nuclear medicine, uh, we are using radioactive substances, injecting to the patient, and uh, the, not clear? Clear? Oh, okay, thank you. And uh, getting the uh, uh, energy to, uh, from the patient to the machine and uh, convert it to images by computerized system. While in radiology, uh, we are using changes in anatomical uh, variation uh, due to disease uh, and converted uh, clinically uh, and, uh, by interpretation. So nuclear medicine depends mainly on physiology, 90% and 10% for anatomy, while in radiology, we are depending on uh, here there is a mistake, it is 90% anatomy and 10% uh, is anyway so the source of imaging for a nuclear medicine is the patient himself after injecting or giving him administration with their IV uh, oral or inhalate uh, inhalation uh, radio tracer and uh, get the energy uh, to be detected by gamma camera but while in radiology the source of the uh, here can you see the source of the uh, energy is the machine penetrating the patient and from the other side we get the uh, information to be interpreted. Uh, radio tracer, the definition of radio tracer is a chemical compound in which an atom is replaced by another atom and therefore uh, it is uh, non-stable. So radio tracer is just like unstable person trying to move, trying to shake, trying to do anything to lose energy. So uh, by getting rid of uh, energy, the tracer from unstable situation will be converted to stable. The commonest uh, one is uh, used is technetium and it is uh, discovered more than 80 years back. It gives energy by uh, or decay by isomeric transition uh, and has a half-life of around six hours. Our definition for radio tracer is a man holding torch. So each radio tracer is composed of two things, man and a torch. Man is the uh, physiological material which moves to anywhere in the body, torch is the source of energy. So when, when we use to image the brain, we, we, we call the man or we use the man who is, who is going to the brain and give him the torch so he goes to the brain, give energy from the brain or give lights from the brain. If I want to image the bone, I use the man which, who goes to the bone and uh, get energy from there. So for example, technetium MDP. MDP is the man which goes to the bone, and technetium is the torch. So we use it, and uh, uh, by the time, after a few hours, it will be accumulated in the bone, and technetium will give me energy so I can image it by the gamma camera. If we are using systemib, same. Systemib is the man which goes to the heart or whatever, and technetium is the torch gives me the energy. When we use uh, technetium hida, Hyde is the man which goes to the liver and excreted by biliary system, while technetium is the torch that gives me energy to be converted to imaging. Nuclear medicine common uses is famous in oncology, endocrine, cardiology, bone imaging. Here bone imaging, I mean for osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. Uh, urinary system, uh, CNS uh, for epilepsy and brain perfusion, uh, immunology. Uh, infectious diseases, hepatobiliary and GI tract, pulmonary system and research. So for endocrine, endocrinology is the second most common usage of nuclear medicine after oncology. I will concentrate more about thyroid imaging because I know the conference is concentrating on thyroid. Uh, common radio tracer used traditional is technetium, iodine-123 and iodine-131. Uh, of course, there are precautions to be used, uh, especially if you are using uh, iodine. So, uh, food and the content high in iodine should be avoided uh, a couple of days before the study. The patient should be well hydrated and 
at least for our fasting. There are other preparations also, but these are general preparation for any radionuclide study we are using for every patient. We use thyroid scan to image the uh, gland imaging as anatomical outline to look for any uh, variation in uh, like retrosternal thyroid or uh, ectopic thyroid tissue uh, to measure the uptake for uh, nodular assessment to check if it is hot or cold lesion uh, by correlation with ultrasound and other radiology modality uh, detection of ectopic uh, thyroid uh, tissue uh, to evaluate the thyroid cancer to check if there is any metastasis or any recurrence after surgery. Of course, there is a very important advice is after giving the administration of radio tracer, the patient must drink water adequately uh, to wash out the esophagus activity. Since uh, esophagus sometimes may overlap the uh, thyroid, I remember one case, uh, we found a cold, so a hot nodule overlapping the isthmus of the thyroid, no anatomical uh, uh, finding by ultrasound or CT scan. We repeated the study after six months, the nodule was on the left thyroid. Same nodule, it was in the left thyroid. After further uh, radiological investigation, we found it was a diverticular from the esophagus and it is overlapping the, uh, so drinking water is very important to avoid false positive finding in thyroid imaging. Uh, this is a normal thyroid scan. The shape is like a peach or a oval shape for both gland. Sometimes you can see the small, sometimes it's very thin according to the thickness of the tissue. The normal uptake by using iodine one, two, three, we scan twice, six hours, and after 24 hours from the administration, three to 16 percent is the normal range. 8 to 25 percent is the normal range after 24 hours. So by knowing these parameters, we can tell if the uptake is low, normal, or high. This is a case of everybody is familiar with Graves' disease. Uh, very straightforward case. We are putting suprasternal notch to, 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 for uh, anatomical landmark. In every thyroid scan, we are using either hot or called uh, radio tracer uh, uh, marker to evaluate what is the uh, suprasternal notch. So in every thyroid scan, you will find there is a marker to tell if the thyroid is below the uh, sternum or not. You can see this gland is a swelling, uh, loss of normal oval shape. The activity is increased and it is very homogeneous. That's typical for Graves' disease. 24 hours, uh, the measurement is around 74%. It's three times the normal. So no differential diagnosis for that. It's typical for Graves' disease. The commonest cause of uh, th uh, hyperthyroidism is subacute thyroiditis. Again, this is a cold marker. So this is the sternal notch. So above it here is this area of the thyroid. You can see homogeneous absent of activity in thyroid gland. Uh, these are the salivary glands. So. Usually in the thyroid scan, we see more activity in the thyroid and less activity in the thyroid, in the salivary glands. Here it is the opposite, more activity in the salivary glands and very uh, faint uptake or uh, activity in the thyroid gland consistent with subacute thyroiditis. In case of toxic multinodular goiter, this is the picture that we can see. The bizarre shape, irregular outline, multiple foci of uh, abnormal increased uptake and uh, there are scattered area of absent uh, normal activity. So the large thyroid gland, there is a irregular activity and irregular uh, areas of absent normal uh, uptake, typical for toxic multinodular goiter. This is a case of toxic nodule, uh, solitary nodule was seen by ultrasound. The patient was presented with hyperthyroidism. We scanned the patient and uh, very focal increased activity, absent uh, activity in the th salivary glands. These two features are typical for toxic nodule. Cold lesion, you can see here by ultrasound, there is a complex lesion which has cystic and solid component. We did thyroid scan. That area is showing no activity. So if it is hot lesion, FNAC is not required because very unlikely to have cancer with increased activity in thyroid scan. Cold lesion up to 20%, they are cancer. So FNAC is not recommended uh, in our practice uh, 
for hot lesion, while it is recommended for cold lesion, in addition to other criteria by ultrasound uh, findings. We will jump to uh, iodine-131 therapy. Uh, iodine-131 emits beta decay, and beta decay has very high energy uh, uh, affecting the electrons outside the shell of the uh, molecular and destroying the uh, nature of uh, boundaries between the atoms, consequently kills the tissue. Uh, it has a penetration a few millimeters, so it is very safe to uh, uh, allow it to, to be trapped in the area uh, for thyroid gland and uh, it will uh, kill the lesion around the thyroid and it's very safe uh, if uh, proper precaution is used. Uh, you are using it for endocrine cases like uh, thyroiditis and uh, Graves disease and the dose is between 20 to 29 millicurie. Here there is no isolation is required. For cancer ablation, uh, we are using it for papillary and uh, follicular type. Uh, other types of cancer, uh, iodine-131 is not useful. The recommended dose is between 30 to 300 millicurie. Uh, rarely we use uh, less than 100 millicurie, especially in the first dose. First uh, dose of therapy of iodine ablation <coughs> is the most important one. And uh, we try to give the maximum possible in the first dose. Uh, it depends on the uh, many factors uh, decides which kind of dose you are going to use. Uh, you are going to isolate the patient after the therapy. Here, uh, to avoid uh, radiating uh, society members and uh, his uh, relatives. Uh, we scan the patient and see the size of the t uh, tumor and the activity. The bigger the size, the higher the dose we give. The hi higher the activity, the less the dose we give. Also, we look if there is lymph node metastasis in the neck or not. If there is lymph node metastasis, we may raise the dose from 100 to 150. If there is lung metastasis, we give up to 200 millicurie. If there is bone metastasis, we reach up to uh, 250 to 300 millicurie. We never give more than 300 millicurie per dose, and the total dose should not exceed 1,000 millicurie as a whole therapy. Because one, the patient is getting 1,000 millicurie, uh, there will be a problem with bone marrow suppression and other uh, yeah, uh, side, uh, severe side effects. Uh, advices we have for a patient in th therapy, first, drinking water, drinking water, and drinking water. These three are very important to eliminate uh, the uh, post-therapy uh, effect. Uh, you make sure that the patient doesn't have uh, constipation before you t start uh, th iodine therapy. Uh, if the patient has a, a constipation, you start uh, treating that with laxatives. You make sure that the patient doesn't have urinary flow obstruction like prostate uh, gland hyperplasia. Uh, if that is situation, maybe you, you need to put Foley's catheter uh, before giving the uh, iodine capsule therapy. Uh, these are uh, very important uh, precautions in order to avoid uh, affecting other uh, organs that we don't want to affect, the one we don't want to attack. Uh, also, chewing gums after the therapy is very important in order to protect the salivary glands and uh, over secretion of the saliva, uh, changing the cloth, laundering the patient cloth uh, separately. Uh, for uh, food, he should be using separated uh, material or dishes uh, after uh, the isolation finish for one week. Many, they ask about breastfeeding uh, after the therapy. Our recommendation is to avoid breastfeeding for at least one year. Many people, they ask about uh, pregnancy again for one year. Pregnancy should be avoided after each dose. Of course, all of us, the, we know the history uh, and the uh, story of Uncle uh, Thum, uh, Fatma al a very famous singer. She was a case of Graves' disease and uh, she was complaining from exophthalmos. That's why always she is wearing these uh, black glasses to, uh, to cover the uh, oxophthalmos. She, uh, at that time in 1940s, 1950s, iodine was not there. So surgery was the therapy. And she was refusing that therapy because she was afraid from her uh, nerve to be damaged and lost their voice. So 
in early 50 iodine uh, therapy became in uh, practice in the United States. She got the, she is one of the first uh, people in the history of humanity to get this uh, therapy. What I want to say that this therapy is not new. More than 70 years back, it was there and it's unchanged. It's so solid, so uh, powerful, so effective that till now, it is the standard therapy for many uh, uh, thyroid uh, disease. Same uh, regime, same uh, protocol you are using since Umkulthum era. Let's jump to parathyroid uh, imaging. There are many, many radio tracers used for parathyroid imaging. The commonest is Sistamibi. Very straightforward, easy uh, scan to do, and uh, less radiation, and it's very cheap. We give radio tracer and we scan after 15 minutes. The whole uh, thyroid gland is showing normal uptake, homogeneous in addition to uh, parathyroid gland. After two hours, the, gland, the thyroid gland will wash out activity while parathyroid gland will remain if there is any pathology. In this case, it, you can see there is parathyroid adenoma in the left lower side. In the second case, there are multiple uptakes in the delayed scan uh, consistent with hyperplasia. This is how we differentiate between hyperplasia and adenoma. Adenoma is usually solitary and very intense in activity, while uh, uh, parathyroid adenoma, uh, they are multiple and uh, there is variation in activity. You can see the, the, this one, it is ectopic parathyroid gland. Even that uh, can be used in nuclear medicine to diagnose ectopic parathyroid gland, which is very difficult in radiological examination. Uh, we go to adrenal and endocrine tumor. Historically, we have two radio tracers commonly used, MIBG and octreotide. They have different mechanism. Uh, one of them is uh, octreotide is somat somatostatin receptor uh, uh, path uh, uh, technique. Uh, you can see that uh, MIBG scan in the, the left side of the image. Uh, it, it, the normal distribution, it goes to the uh, salivary gland, goes to the heart. Before in the, the history of nuclear medicine, uh, system, uh, uh, MIBG was used for cardiac imaging. Not anymore, of course. It goes to the, uh, sorry, for the uh, liver and spleen. Uh, that's a normal activity. It, it is excreted through both uh, urinary and uh, GI. So it, uh, normal uh, bowel uptake is uh, the normal finding in MIBG. While in uh, octreotide scan, it, it is excreted mainly through the kidney. So when you see a kidney, this is octreotide scan. There is no activity in the uh, salivary glands, very intense uptake in kidney, and both are showing uh, urinary bladder activity. Octreotide has more uh, resolution and less background in comparison to MIBG. Uh, both are used for uh, same, uh, I mean, there is like overlapping uh, usage for both uh, kind of uh, radio tracer, whether for diagnostic or therapy. Uh, MIBG scan is a norepinephrine analog, and these are the diseases commonly we use MIBG to diagnose. Uh, fecal cytoma, neuroblastoma, and other uh, types of neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, in this scan, you can see there is intense thyroid uptake because the preparation for this patient was not appropriate. There is a kind of local solution they have to give before the scan in order to protect the thyroid and prevent MIBG scan. If you go to previous uh, MIBG scan, there is no thyroid uptake because that was uh, properly performed. While in the second one, you can see there is uptake in the thyroid gland. This means the patient didn't have local solution, and this is quite vital to protect unnecessary over radiation. Very clearly, you can see lesion, which has been diagnosed later as fucromocytoma. It was in the adrenal gland, and uh, usually in uh, cases of neuroendocrine tumor, uh, some centers that are doing both MIBG and octreotide scans to see which one is showing more uh, activity, which one is more intense, the octreotide scan or the MIBG scan. They start with the MIBG. If the activity is high, they start th the therapy if therapy is advised or surgery. But if they didn't find uh, activity, either they go for PET or, uh, or for uh, octreotide to see if there is uh, more activity in the other scan, in the octreotide, they choose the octreotide for therapy rather than MIBG. 
Octillery scan still used uh, many places where PET is not available, uh, mainly for neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, it has very good uh, background resolution in comparison to MIBG. Uh, in this case, this is a pathological finding where uh, uh, the, 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 the tumor is showing in increased activity and uh, uh, is very clearly seen separated from the kidney. Uh, in the presence of spec CT, adding CT to the uh, octreotide scan is giving us more physiological and anatomical information uh, for the patients. There are non-neuroendocrine tumor which are showing uh, activity by uh, octreotide like meningioma, astrocytoma, breast cancer, and lymphoma. Of course, th that doesn't mean that this, uh, we should go for octreotide study to evaluate lymphoma or uh, meningioma because we have radiological investigation which gives better information. Jumping to PET-CT area about uh, thyroid, uh, yes, FDG PET scan shows uh, more uh, information, especially in very malignant uh, cases where thyroid globulin is elevated and there is no abnormal finding seen in uh, thyroid scan. PET CT is the choice. And usually, if the PET is positive, thyroid uh, nuclear study, other uh, tracers is negative, that's signs of severe malignancy and high grade. Also, PET gives you information where is the metabolism and where is the necrotic area. You, if you can see here, centrally there is no metabolism indicating necrosis, while marginally it's showing very intense metabolism. So, for radiologist and interventional uh, person, uh, he knows from where he can take the FNAC. If he take the tissue from the central part of the lesion, it will be uh, false uh, negative. Uh, several radio tracers in PET are used for uh, neuroendocrine uh, imaging. Uh, the commonest and the best is FDG till now. We are using for thyroid cancer, and the scenario is if the, the thyroid globulin is elevated and thyroid scan is negative, PET CT is the next step. Uh, also, uh, here uh, the, uh, the, the philosophy is different than uh, nuclear medicine. Uh, the philosophy here for PET that tumor and, and uh, inflamed lesions, they are consuming glucose more than the adjacent tissue. So when there is cancer, there is more consumption of glucose. So when you are giving a glucose analog, it will be more uh, FDG metabolism. Uh, for uh, thyroid scan, cancer is usually cold lesion, while in PET-CT, cancer is hot lesion or hypermetabolic. Also for adrenal tumor, we are using FDG for chromocytoma. Again, uh, the, we do that if MIBG scan is negative and there is very strong suspicion of MIF chromocytoma, we go for PET and like this case, uh, there is a, it was a negative MIBG scan. When they did the PET scan, it is very clear hyperactive uh, lesion and this is a sign of malignancy because we know 10% of fear cytoma they are malignant. Usually these 10%, they are very low in activity in MIBG and very intense in PET scan. Also gallium uh, 68 uh, became in uh, service and it is taking over, especially for neuroendocrine tumor. It is a somatostatin receptor. Uh, material and several types are uh, available. It has a very uh, promising uh, diagnostic modality for uh, diagnosing uh, neuroendocrine tumor. Also, we have 18 uh, fluorine dupa. Uh, it is uh, again, actually, this dupa is used for uh, neuroimaging. We used to scan, uh, do PET CT uh, using dupa to, uh, to diagnose uh, Parkinson's disease. But they found in the researches that neurointegrine tumor showing uh, metabolism, and uh, it became uh, approved by FDA to be used for imaging a neuroendocrine tumor. In addition to congenital hyperinsulinemia, combination with the other uh, medication before the study, it's showing the area of uh, lesions in the pancreas where uh, it is hyperactive. Uh, and uh, the sensitivity for this study at this stage is between 50 to 70%. Still, it's not uh, to the top, 
in comparison to MRI or CT scan, dynamic CT, but still there are cases where MRI is not giving you any answer while uh, if DOPA is solving the issue and answering the question. Here a comparison between MIBG scan and uh, FDOBA. Uh, very clear that MIBG is blurred image. It's showing you a lesion plus uh, a bone marrow uh, infiltration. In, in uh, 18 FDOPA, the image is very clear and uh, the, the, the anatomy is, you can tell where is the exact distribution in the abdomen and the bone marrow. But still, MIBG is uh, for uh, such a case of uh, neuroblastoma uh, is the standard, not only for diagnostic, even for therapy. We are going, uh, we need MIBG scan because it will help us in treating the patient. So in, in, in diagnostic, PET is more advanced, but if we go for therapy, still MIBG is the uh, required. Uh, and this is comparison between several types of uh, radio tracers used in PET and uh, MIBG for the same patient. You can see that number, the, the second one, the activity is more clear, more pathology, more lesions you can see in this a case of neuroendocrine tumor. And some uh, 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 radio tracer is showing you false information, like showing you the vessels, uh, irregular or heterogeneous metabolism in the liver. Uh, some people may uh, wrongly explain it as uh, liver metastasis. Excretion of the kidney is obscuring any lesion adjacent to it, while we don't see these uh, findings in the MIBG. But still, the standard recommendation for scanning these cases is MIBG, not for diagnosis, because you are making a baseline to uh, go further for therapy where MIBG is still used as therapeutic agent. Thank you.